Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is Session 12, Part 3 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and the role of the human conscience. Outlining how to use the conscience as a guide in our life how the conscience builds sincere faith, and how the conscience encourages forgiveness and repentance. This session was recorded on the 20th of February 2018 from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. The role of the human conscience in forgiveness and repentance. So this is where now we get to... Uh, relate everything that we've learned about the conscience to the theme of our series, which is forgiveness and repentance. Mm. Uh, it seems to me it's already from what we've learned about the conscience, we can begin to see there's a lot of ways that the conscience might help us with forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. Uh, so this is the opportunity now for me to ask you about all of that in <laughs> detail. <laughs> yes. Well, if we just say firstly, though, that obviously, as we can see, we discussed the section on compensation first because we can see that compensation also informs us about when we have sinned. Mm -hmm. So if we're receiving corrective compensation, that compensation is informing us that we have sinned. And obviously forgiveness and repentance is all about when have we sinned and when have other people sinned. Mm -hmm. so, so obviously being informed about when we have sinned is a very helpful thing in terms of determining whether we need to be repentant. When it comes to the conscience, it, the conscience is even more refined than that because rather than it just being a law in operation, mm -hmm. which basically provides positive reinforcement when we are in harmony with the law and, and corrective reinforcement when we're out of harmony with the law, conscience is, it provides us with more information. Conscience is basically saying, God can tell us at any point in time what is correct and what is not correct. He can also tell us before we make the step into doing the deed or taking the action or having the feeling mm -hmm. what the potential results will be through the compensa as compensation. So he can actually inform us beforehand this is the penalty associated or this is corrective penalty associated with this particular act. Mm -hmm. This is how severe this act is from God's perspective. And, and so this is actually now telling us a whole heap of information before we take action. So rather than it being the operation of a law, it's, it's more than that. It's now the ability to receive direct communication from God about the choices and that we're about to make or and also the choices we have made. Mm. So, so this is a very good thing if you think about it, because what it does is it helps mitigate mistakes we will make mm -hmm. or mitigate uh, bad decisions that result in pain to us as well. Mm -hmm. And the conscience allows us to do such things. Yeah. And, and that's why the conscience and developing the conscience is so good, but it's also why the conscience has a large role to play in the process of forgiveness and repentance. Because rather than being forced by the law yeah. into a state of forgiveness and repentance, we can now actually be encouraged through the operation or the reception of truth from God to go into a state of forgiveness and repentance before we're forced by the law to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and this means that we can voluntarily take actions that would otherwise have been forced upon us by the laws of compensation. Yeah, it's fantastic. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, in this section, um, I'd also like to talk to you about the concept of faith and because faith, as we've previously discussed, is a part of forgiveness and repentance. So we're going to talk about how faith and conscience are related. Yep. Uh, we'll talk about how they both uh, factors, faith and conscience, work together to help us repent. And then we'll talk specifically about how the conscience can help us to forgive and help us to repent. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. So let's start with how faith and conscience are related. 
What can you tell us about how faith and conscience are related? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you think about it clearly, you can see that if we do not believe there is such a thing as a conscience, and we do not believe that God made us, and we do not believe that God is able to communicate to us via this mechanism of the conscience. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we have no faith that this is actually a, an absolute truth. Then obviously we're not going to engage the conscience. Yeah. It, it, it makes sense that if you do not believe in something and you do not have faith in it, you will not do it. Uh, it's a bit like if you, uh, you know, it, as a very basic illustration, let's say somebody said to you look if you jump in this vehicle a car which mm -hmm. we call a car i can take you from here which is like about 220 k's away from our nearest city to our nearest city in brisbane and you say and you, would you jump in the car if you had no faith that that was possible of course you wouldn't you wouldn't even bother getting in the car no. you you would you your your system of belief would tell you that it's all pointless yeah. because there's no there's no there's no reality in what's being told to you. You would think the person is either lying or joking or certainly not serious. You, yeah. you, you know, maybe trying to trick you or whatever else you might think, and uh, and so you won't engage the process of jumping in the car and travelling to Brisbane. Mm -hmm. It's very similar when it comes to the operation of our conscience. If we don't have faith that there is such a thing as a conscience. And this conscience is a mechanism of communication via which God has uh, the ability to share absolute truth with us. And we don't understand that mechanism at all and we don't believe in it at all, then we're not going to engage the conscience. We mm. just are not. We're not going to jump in the car and, <laughs> and actually test it out and see whether it's possible. Faith allows us to make the step of trying it out and testing it out to see whether it is actually true or not. Mm. So if we've already established faith that um, God is a loving creator and God wants us to know truth, then we and, might... And God wants to communicate with his children. You know, yep. that would make sense. If, if God is a loving God, surely he'd want to communicate information, factual information to the people he made, you mm -hmm. know, the children he has. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Mm. Mm. So if we had that faith, then that's going to make us more likely to experiment with or begin to feel about this issue of conscience exactly yeah. so without without faith you really are probably not going to engage the process of conscience at all then there's this other factor isn't there when we do receive god's truth about a matter mm -hmm. uh be that via the conscience or through another means but we accept it as God's truth and we allow that to trigger us emotionally, trigger the addictions and the false beliefs that oppose it, mm -hmm. and we release emotion, uh, then we feel the positive benefits of, of receiving God's truth. We see a progression in our life and that's going to make us more open to receiving God's truth from any, uh, that builds a faith that receiving God's truth is a good thing, which opens us up potentially to the conscience. Would you say that? Well, I'd say it uh, builds a faith that, the con you know, receiving the truth via the conscience had some benefit. But mm -hmm. but we could even go back a little further than that. Yep. If we don't have faith that um, feeling our emotions will release them, then, of course, we won't even bother releasing them. Mm -hmm. So this is what I notice for a lot of people is we talk about things like the conscience and, you know, feeling emotion. But most people talk about it, but they don't actually do it. And the problem with not actually doing it is that you, in the end, will not believe it. And, and unless you do it the right way, it's a bit like um, with, any, with any task that we might be faced with in our day-to-day -day life, you can be shown the wrong way and it won't work. But if you show the right way, then it will work. It's a bit like, say, an aircraft flying. If you turn the wings of the aircraft upside down <laughs> and then try to fly, yeah. the faster you go, the more compressed on the ground you will be. Yeah. And, and obviously you won't be able to fly. So, so you can see if you do something the wrong way, it just won't work. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I feel a lot of people don't understand about the conscience and even the relationship with God. Most people are attempting to have a relationship with God their way and they're having, they, they believe about the conscience their way as well and it's not the way god's way it's not the truth about those particular things and then when it doesn't work 
or it appears to not work, they go oh, throw up their hands and say, "Oh, it's all false anyway. It's what a what a bunch of crap," you know. Yeah. The reason why that happens is because we have not been informed about how things work, mm. and we have not got either that, or we have not got the faith that how we've been informed is worth following through on. Mm. Um, in, in other words. We need to follow through on the information before it's going to benefit us. And this really does apply to the conscience as well, doesn't it? So firstly, we won't, we're we not going to listen to our conscience at all unless we have some faith that God's actually transmitting truth to us via the conscience. Secondly, we're not going to process emotionally anything unless we have some faith that processing emotion actually does is part of the way that God designed us to live and actually the way that God designed us to feel communication from God, mm -hmm. unless we understand that, we're, we're not going to take the steps to actually develop our conscience. And so faith and conscience are like very closely interwoven with each other. Without the faith, you, you're probably not going to do anything about trying to understand or attempt to use your conscience. And, and so, yeah, the, the two qualities, the, well, the quality of faith and the mechanism of conscience are very much closely connected to each other mm -hmm. for, for many, many reasons. And I've just given a few. Mm -hmm. Also, as you pointed out, when we choose to act upon what the conscience tells us, there will be certain emotional responses that we have. Also, when we choose to act upon what the conscience tells us, there will be certain results that happen in our life. Both the emotions we have, which will release things from our life, which will make our life better, and the positive results that come from acting upon the conscience in a positive way, mm -hmm. both of them are faith strengthening. So, mm -hmm. so you could say that unless you engage in action with the conscience, that you actually do it the right way, and then you measure the results, unless that happens, faith cannot build. Yeah. And, and so acting upon the conscience is one way that you can actually build your faith. Yeah. But most people have a poor faith right at the beginning, and so they don't even believe that it's possible that God is communicating truth via the conscience, so they don't even try all of that. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why the majority of people are completely unaware mm. of how the conscience works and also unaware about its benefits. So um, something that we'd written in the notes here is that when we ignore conscience, we make it impossible to grow faith in God and in love. So how integral then is the conscience to the development of faith? If a person ignores their conscience forever, will they never develop faith? Well, remember that the truth comes via the conscience to the human soul. Mm -hmm. Now, it is possible to develop faith using other means than actually being told truth and then acting upon it. So, for example, uh, one method of building faith is that you, you take an action. It's, a, it's the wrong action. You get some kind of penalty for it. And then, so an example of that would be uh, there's a stove and it's hot, mm -hmm. uh, too hot for you to touch uh, without harming yourself, and you decide to put your hand on top. After you put your hand on the top for a few seconds, it burns your skin. Mm -hmm. Now you know that the stove that's hot will burn your skin. Now you will have faith that the next time you think go to touch something hot, mm -hmm. there you know that's highly likely that you, if it's too hot, you will burn your skin. You, yep. you, this will be a knowledge that is developed in you through experience. So one way to gain some faith about future actions is to actually have knowledge from past experience. Yeah. But it but it is a painful way. You know, it, you know, it would be better if somebody could say that's hot and if you touch it and explain that if you, your skin will burn off and it will be terribly painful, you want to avoid that and you could do all of that without touching the top of the stove, that would probably be better for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, and therefore, you know, easier for you to cope with and you'd have less pain in your life. Mm -hmm. So what what I see happening on on the planet instead of that is that we are basically like the person ignoring that the stove is hot because they don't want to listen to every, anybody else saying that it's hot and that it will be damaging. And we all decide to just go touch it first to see for ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, We all have this sort of attitude of 
I want to. I don't want. I don't trust what anybody else is saying, or what anybody, or whatever truth might come to me through other sources. I'm going to validate it myself. The problem with validating yourself is that it's a very slow and often painful way mm-hmm. of, of gaining truth. The conscience can negate all of that mm-hmm. pain, because if we believe in it and we engage it and we have faith in it, and we will start to feel its results where God is saying to us, don't do this or do that. This is the reasons why. And he's not telling us that we have to. He's just saying this. If you do that, this will be the result. If you do this good thing, that'll be the positive result. And he's showing us through his feelings about each thing. In doing that, now we have this beautiful ability to negate any personal pain in the process of our growth. Mm -hmm. And because basically we're just trusting what God tells us about the issue until such a time as the issue is proven to us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's going to take, obviously be a lot more pleasurable experience than having to go through the painful experience mm. of personal experience without that assistance. Mm. Mm. Okay, so that's how faith is built. Yeah, so if you think about it, if you trust somebody in what they say to you first, and then you go ahead and you know, try it out and it turns out to be true, and then you go and you trust another thing they say to you and it turns out to be true and you trust 99 things they say to you and it all turns out to be true, then by the time you get to the hundredth thing, there's a pretty high likelihood you'll trust it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And it'll probably turn out to be true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But if you don't start that process trusting at least one thing, then of course you will never know whether it's true that you can trust that person or have faith in what that person's saying or not. So uh, obviously, to make this transition into actually utilising the conscience, faith is a very, very important part or quality that we need in order to trust that what we're receiving through this, con- this conscious mechanism is valid in our lives and it is coming from God and we need to do something about it if we want to benefit from it. <laughs> so it sounds like you're saying we can develop faith in many ways and some of them are slow. But if we engage with the conscience, we can begin to develop faith in the conscience, yep. which will then um, assist us to develop faith in many things as well. That's right. So my first century experience was one of, you know, I over, over, uh, from a young age, I started trusting this mechanism that I could feel that God was talking to me and telling me, you know, things that are good and things that are bad and showing me through the different experiences that I was having and observing. And, and I would ask, you know, what about what's that going on there? And he would say, say, you know, through the mechanism of the conscience, say to me what the truth was about those things. Eventually, through that mechanism, I discovered the truth of receiving love from God. And mm-hmm. um, if I didn't have, de- if I hadn't have developed that mechanism of the conscience, I would never have discovered that love was possible to receive. Yeah. And then I would never have tried to receive it. Mm-hmm. So to me, the conscience mechanism is a very important mechanism and that I've utilized all my life mm. to to discover truth and to stick and to and to understand it mm-hmm. and and it saved me a lot of heartache in my life it really has yeah. particularly in my first century life in this life I have it of in early part, parts of this life sometime I avoided what my conscience was saying but it's been a rare thing because I I still have had that feeling you know that no it's pretty clear what's being said to me and what needs to be done here. And, mm-hmm. and when I analyze the issues of things like ethics and morality and so forth, I can see pretty clear that that, all, that what, what I'm being told through the conscience matches up to those things. And so that's helped me through a lot of very traumatic periods of time in my life mm-hmm. to stay on the road, which is what I call the narrow path to, to God's way, you know, yeah. Yeah. to stay on that road. Uh, rather than digress from it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I feel faith and conscience are, are really closely in, entwined with each other. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, faith doesn't exist without truth. And, and the conscience is the mechanism by which you receive absolute truth. Mm-hmm. So obviously the two are going to be connected. Our level of faith is going to be connected with how much we listen to and act upon our conscience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, Now we're going to talk about rejecting the conscience and how this creates an illusion of faith or an empty faith. 
<laughs> so for this section, I'm going to quote from the Bible because mm-hmm. um, there's a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, mm-hmm. which says, and I've got a couple of different versions here. So I'll read from the New World Translation and then the New International. It's quite similar, I think. So mm. it says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have thrust aside mm-hmm. and have experienced shipwreck concerning their faith. Mm. Or in the New International, it says, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have su- have suffered shipwreck with regard to faith. Mm. So it sounds like um, that rejecting good conscience and faith uh, has led to a shipwreck of faith. How would rejecting conscience cause us to have this situation? Yes, yeah, so really what the verse, these Bible verses are saying is that if we reject the conscience, it affects our faith. So, so when it talks about a good conscience, which some have thrust aside mm-hmm. or which some have rejected, it's saying they're actually rejecting the operation of their conscience. Mm-hmm. And, and in rejecting the operation of your conscience, what eventually happens is you now no longer have any real faith. Yeah. And, and, and it's quite obvious probably to see ha- how that is the case, because remember that faith requires absolute truth as its basis. Yes. And the conscience is the mechanism via which we receive absolute truth from God. Mm. So naturally, if we reject our conscience, we now have a faith that's not based on any truth or based on suppositions that we have made or just our personal beliefs or ideas or concepts of the world or or belief systems of religion that religions have passed down or personal experience or any of these other things that mm-hmm. it could be based on but it's not based on absolute truth yeah and if it's not based on absolute truth it's not really faith anymore yeah. it's just opinion it's just an idea it's just a concept it, it's not it's not based in fact and this is why it ends up in a shipwreck of your faith, because yeah. at the end of the day, if you're not basing your faith on fact, mm-hmm. anything can come along and influence your faith because it's not got a solid foundation of being based on fact. Mm-hmm. So, so without the conscience, it's very hard to have a solid foundation of faith. Yeah. And sooner or later, something or someone is going to come along and say the very thing that is that you know pulls out the the last vestige if you like of the poor foundation of your faith yes which is the last belief you know comes crumbling to the ground of what you thought was true but uh-huh. now you realize it can't be true and yeah. they pull that out and now all of your faith just crumbles into disarray like a house falling down uh-huh. and uh, and this is a, this is exactly what happens to most people when it comes to their religious faith mm. Because religious faith is not based upon absolute truth, Mm -hmm. but rather based upon, in the majority of cases, just personal opinion, frequently all you have to do is pull out a few of the foundation corners of their faith, you know, by mm-hmm. by destroying the actual falsehood that it's based upon. Yeah. And all of a sudden their so-called faith no longer exists. Yes. And there's plenty of people who have passed from this earth who believe themselves to have faith in yeah. their religion, only to find after they've passed or shortly after they've passed that all the things they believed in were not based on fact. Mm. And so now their faith is nothing and mm. they have given up having any faith at all in that place and frequently gone off and done some very terrible things afterwards because they now believe there is no such reason to have any faith in God. Yeah. And this is the problem with false belief. Mm. False belief creates an image or an illusion of faith, but it's not based on fact. And if we had an operating conscience, we would know it. Yeah. But because most people don't have an operating conscience, yes. a really good conscience, as it's really suggesting here, yep. they don't have an operating conscience that, that they're listening to and responding to and acting upon. They end up in a state where they've now based all of their life and mm-hmm. many of their actions on something that is an illusion, yeah. a, a falsehood. And uh, unfortunately, often that is attached with a lot of quite distraught and 
angry emotions after mm-hmm. you find that out. Mm. So, so when we look at this, uh, this kind of verse, you can see that um, without, this, without the conscience having a connection with absolute truth, we are basically empty in our faith. There is no proof of faith. There is no evidence supporting our faith. And so our faith is nothing more than an emotional belief system. And that's it. Yeah. And, and there are literally millions of those on the planet, all of which eventually will be destroyed by someone finding out the absolute truth about yeah. those particular things. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's quite ironic, isn't it, that we're quoting from the Bible and yet you're sort of saying that the majority of religious <laughs> faiths on the planet aren't based on absolute truth. And yet no. this, really you're saying this, there is truth contained within this verse, aren't you? All religious faiths on the planet have ab- some absolute truth in, in, in them. In them, yeah. And, uh, and those things are easily able to be determined if you have an operating conscience. Yes. But if you don't have an operating conscience and all you do is follow the book, mm-hmm. the Koran or the Bible or whatever other holy book you wish to follow, yeah. then you're going to be severely disappointed because at the end of the day, that book cannot contain and does not contain the truth, the absolute truth, as God knows it to be. Mm -hmm. And no book can. It's it's unrealistic to expect that any book can. But if we have a direct connection with the source of all truth, it's like having a book that's an infinite book available on all matters of truth that we can be informed upon. And unless that is there and operating, then all we're doing is having personal opinions or personal emotions or personal beliefs uh, that we wish to hold on to for whatever reason, and we call that faith. Yeah. But it's an empty faith. Yeah. It, it means nothing, and, and, and it will die a, a natural death in the future mm-hmm. because sooner or later truth will attack the foundation. Yeah. And, and once truth exposes the foundation, which is nothing, yeah. then everything will be exposed and everything will just collapse. Mm. It's like in the first century, I called it like a man building a house on sand. Mm. You know, a little bit of water of truth comes and washes the sand away. What's left? The house is gone. Yeah. Right. If you build a house on rock, water comes, some truth comes, washes the sand away, but it's built on rock. It's built on the firm foundation. Now it's going to stand. Mm. Mm. And it's the same illustration here with regard to our conscience. If we if we have an operating conscience that is actually focused in harmony with the truth that we've received from God, now our faith is built on a firm, firm, foundation, firm foundation, and it's real. Yeah, it's real faith. Yeah, not not just supposition, ideas, concepts, beliefs. You know, my own opinion or any of those kind mm-hmm. of things, which will all in the end disappear if they are not in harmony with absolute truth. Mm. And very often we do have faith in things that support our own unloving condition, don't we? Because it it helps us to avoid painful emotion or confrontation. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why we have faith in false things. Many of those reasons were created in our childhood, where our parents taught us to have faith in something that's false, and we just imbibed that in the belief system. And so now we go ahead, we believe the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Or we have a deep longing to believe it because we... We're trying to avoid some specific emotions that we don't want to have to process. And so, you know, we long to believe in something. We want to believe in something, but that's false. There's plenty of reasons psychologically as well as emotionally as to why a person would want to believe something that's false. Mm -hmm. And the key is if we had an operating conscience, that would confront our desire to believe false things. It would say to us, hang on a sec. What you believe is false. <laughs> Whether you want to believe it or not, it's false. It's it, false. That's yeah. what God would say to us. And it's false for these reasons, you know. If we had an operating conscience, it would help mitigate many of these problems that we face in our day-to-day life with regard to truth. Mm, mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Is there anything else you wanted to mention on that? I think you've covered everything we've got in our notes there. Um, yeah, if, if we just go back to the, to, to the basics with it, we can see if we do not have absolute truth, then faith is impossible. Stop, stop calling your personal opinion 
faith. That's not that's not faith. Yeah. That's just personal opinion. That's yeah. just an idea or a concept. Unless it's based on absolute truth, faith is impossible. And unless we receive absolute truth from the source of absolute truth, God, then any real faith in anything can only be obtained through hard personal experience. That's the only way it's going. That's the only other way it can be obtained. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Having a clean, clear or good conscience. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that I'd like to talk to you about because this is a very common saying on earth. Oh, I've got a clear conscience or I don't think um, I can do that in good conscience or I feel clean, my conscience is clean. You know, these kinds of sayings are very common. And to, to illustrate or to discuss this point, we're going to use another Bible quote from First Timothy. Yeah. Uh, chapter 1 verse 5 and this uh, verse says the goal of this commandment is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith mm. so if we can just as a, as a part of this introduction state that that many holy books on the planet including the bible and the Quran, do make comments about conscience or a mechanism of conscience and um, many of those comments are, you know, don't understand the full picture of what the conscience really is. But there is some level of understanding of what it means to have a good conscience or a clean conscience or those kind of things. And we'll talk more about the technicalities of that in mm -hmm. one of our questions. But at this stage, what we want to do is look at the, like the, uh, the, the concept of what it means to have a good conscience. Yes. How... Uh, whether whether it, it's technically possible to have a good conscience yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or not, and also what it means to have a clean or a clear conscience, because obviously these terms are used a lot on the planet, even amongst people who are not religious, mm -hmm. they're used, because they, they come from old days of references to religious texts. That's right. And, uh, and many people don't realise that many of the things they say in their day-to-day -day life comes from some religious text, even though they don't personally believe in those texts anymore. Yeah. But the principles remain in many cases. So let's have a look at the principles regarding <laughs> <laughs> the operation of our conscience. All right. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to talk about what ha what it means to have a good conscience. And in the Bible verse we're talking about, 1 Timothy 1.5, uh, there's a reference to good conscience. But can you just tell me what it means to have a good conscience? Well, if we, we, we need to have a technical discussion about the issue yes. and then a, maybe a not technical discussion okay. about the issue. From a, from a purely technical perspective, it's impossible to have a good or a bad conscience. <laughs> <laughs> so as, I, as I've just said, it's technically impossible to have a good or a bad conscience. And why is that? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, the conscience it just is. It's a mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's a mechanism via which God communicates truth to the human soul. And as we've stated in previous sessions, this mechanism operates in every person on this planet and every person in the spirit world. It, 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 it doesn't work bad or work <laughs> good. It just works. <laughs> it's always working. And God, who is the source of the information, is always working to communicate with his children. So, so all of the information that the conscience actually receives, I mean the real conscience, the, the one we're defining as the real conscience, mm -hmm. All the information that the conscience receives is truthful. So, so it's never bad. It's never, there can never be technically a bad conscience or a good conscience. Mm -hmm. It is just a conscience that operates. Mm -hmm. Now, we can detune from the conscience that operates mm -hmm. by imposing emotional restrictions upon it, which include belief systems imposed upon it, yep. including the belief system that there is no God and there is no such thing as my conscience which automatically means that I probably won't listen to it, <laughs> even though it is still working and it, is, and it always works. Mm -hmm. Now, under those circumstances, we could say perhaps that I've got a bad conscience in that it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> of course, from God's perspective, it's always working and the mechanism in the human soul is always working. Mm -hmm. So if it's not seeming to work, 
it's something to do with our desires and our passions and our belief systems that have caused it to not work. Mm. But that's not really what the verse you're referring to refers to when it talks about having a good conscience. When it talks about having a good conscience, it's talking about having a good feeling that something that you're doing or saying or feeling is actually good for you. It's mm -hmm. something that's right, that's righteous, yeah. that's in harmony with truth. Yes. Now, I have a lot of problems with that because the reality is a lot of people feel good about bad things. <laughs> they do. They do. You know, and a lot of people will justify these good feelings about bad th things. So there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people on the planet who think drinking alcohol is great. In fact, I, I, in fact, it's very rare to meet a person who doesn't think that, mm -hmm. right? So, so, you know, their conscience is telling them something different, but they're not listening to it. But they still say that they have a good conscience. Well, I wouldn't say they have a good conscience no. because the conscience isn't working. They're not <laughs> listening to it. <laughs> when I say working, they're not listening to it. Yeah. If they were listening to it, they'd know God would have already been demonstrating to them that having uh, alcohol kills parts of your body. You know, <laughs> it's well known now that that's the case. But even thousands of years ago, you, if you had a connection with your conscience, you would know that. Yeah. And so you wouldn't do it. If you loved yourself, you wouldn't yeah. do it. And if you loved others, you probably wouldn't do it either um, for lots of reasons. So, so the reality is that most of us say we have a good conscience about things. There's certain things that don't bother our conscience, but it, it doesn't indicate whether our conscience is good or bad because our conscience is never good or bad. It just is. Yeah. <laughs> and any good or bad feeling we have from our conscience is purely frequently just a good or bad feeling about the choices we make. And uh, frequently our choices are made in disharmony with love and we think they're good. Yeah. So, so I don't think that's a very reliable measure of what is a good conscience. Mm -hmm. mm. Can we feel good if we are connected to our conscience and we know that our choice is out of harmony with truth? Can we feel good about that choice? Well, yes, I feel we can. Um, you know, that's what causes people to continue making choices that are bad for other people, but good for them. Um, so when I say good for them, I mean, you know, that they believe are good for them, mm. where they are abusing other people to get some personal benefit, for example. Mm. And I do believe that people can make like choices that they believe are good, that are actually from God's perspective, bad. Yes, yeah, so I suppose I can see two scenarios mm. you're describing. You're describing uh, the situation where someone is purposefully detuned from their conscience. Uh, they're not listening, if you like, to what God is conveying. And then mm. they feel good about their choices because their choices are helping them to feel, to avoid some pain or to feel superior or whatever. They might feel good. Yeah, but what, the question becomes, what are they comparing the good with? <laughs> They're certainly not comparing it with God's version of God. No. So, so they've got to be comparing it with something else. So what is it? I don't know. What is well, it? Most probably it's their own concept of what is good, right? Yes, yes. So, so most people have internal to themselves their belief systems, which is their concept of good, which is very different to God's concept of good. Yes, yes. And so the majority of people who have a so-called good conscience and claim they have one don't actually have a good conscience from God's perspective. Yeah. They only have a good conscience because they feel by their own measure that what they're doing is good. Yes. So, so you're kind of saying there that they have a false sense of a conscience through their own belief systems or a false sense of right and wrong. Could I call it that? Yes. Their, yeah. their measure of right and wrong yep. is flawed yep. based upon their beliefs about love and so forth. Yes. And, uh, and they're not connected with their conscience in saying it. So, so we shouldn't even call it a conscience at all. No. They, they basically just feel good. Yeah. And the reason why they feel good is because there's nothing going on in, inside of them that would cause them to pause and go, hang on a sec, uh, maybe what I'm doing is not so good. Yeah. <laughs> and the conscience could do that, but they've detuned themselves from the conscience or, or desired to not have a connection with it. Yeah. And, uh, and so ignore it. 
Yeah. But it's always working. Yes. You know, there's plenty. We can easily correct this problem. Yes. Uh, God's always attempting still to correct it through giving the person truth, but they're just ignoring the truth that's coming to them. Mm. And they're comparing, they're not comparing it with God's level of like truth, but rather they're just comparing it with their own, their yeah. personal truth, if you like, yeah. which is very flawed. Yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't call that a good conscience. I would call that a, a, a good uh, connection with your own addictions. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so getting back to my question, yeah. um, it, it sounds like you've, you're outlining a couple of scenarios in your discussion here. You're saying there's a scenario where a person, as you just described, not listening to the conscience, detuned, actively don't care, feel great about their choices because it's meeting their addictions and they just feel like... Uh, I've got this sense of what's right and wrong and I'm in harmony with that and it's all good. My yeah. life's all good. And my okay. sense of what's right and wrong is right. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, Obviously. I'm God, I'm allowed to make my own choices. Yeah. <laughs> so in that scenario, a person feels good. Yeah. Um, and they might call it the conscience because they, if they want to or whatever. Well, they can call but, it a good conscience, but it's got nothing to do with conscience. Yes. Yeah. So that bit is clear. Mm. Now there's another scenario where the, a person is um, has an intermittent, if you like, or just a connection with their conscience, whether they call it that or not, mm -hmm. um, they have received or do receive some absolute truth from God about their actions mm -hmm. and about matters. Mm -hmm. Is it possible then for that person, this is kind of a technical question about the operations of the conscience, mm -hmm. if, say, it's me, I hear, look, it's going to be a bad idea if you go ahead and do that, and I go ahead and do it, can I feel really good about that? I mean, does my soul allow that? Well, see, it depends, doesn't it? Because inside of your soul is a group of emotions. Some of those emotions are flawed beliefs about love. Mm -hmm. if, if these emotions and your actions match your flawed beliefs about love, you might think it's good, even though you're being told that it's wrong. Gotcha. So there's plenty of times when God tells us, no, that's wrong, and we just completely ignore it and go, no, what I think's right because yeah. I feel good. Yeah. Right. In other words, we're we're not concerned about our future pain or the future pain of others, and all we care about is meeting our addictive pleasures mm -hmm. right at the moment, and mm -hmm. we don't care about the results of that frequently. So we can have an operating conscience and still do that. Yeah. Of course, from the Bible term, it won't be a good conscience. There'll be times when our conscience, as another Bible term pricks us or, uh -huh. you know, pro prods us and says, maybe you're doing the wrong thing, yeah. right? And there's plenty of times when that happens in a yeah. person's day-to-day -day life. There is. Almost daily, most people have little proddings that go, maybe I'm not making the right decision here, yeah. right? Most of us don't listen to it because we're more addicted to pleasing ourselves and gaining the immediate pleasure that results from pleasing ourselves rather than actually looking at the long-term effects of any of our decisions. So it sounds like you're saying if a person does have some connection with their conscience, they can still go ahead and feel good momentarily or briefly. Yeah. Uh, but if that connection is there, it's likely that they'll feel bothered because that's another term we use, bothered yes. by your conscience. Yes. Uh, or prodded as yes. time goes on about their um, past or current actions. Yes, and, yep. uh, and during those times, usually people find it hard to sleep and they find, you know, hard to, it, things just bother them and they yep. don't really know why, you know. And that's when people frequently return to, turn to substances in order to stop the bother, yes. in order to turn it off, tune away from the bother that we feel with the contrast of truth being presented through the conscience and the contrast of that with what I'm doing yeah. causes me to be feel bothered. And then for the majority of us, we choose to not be bothered by mm -hmm. taking further steps to detune mm -hmm. from what the conscience is actually telling us. Yeah. So that, that's a very frequent choice that we make. And that's not obviously, uh, that obviously is not a good conscience in operation. Mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conscience that's uh, still operating. Of course, we're still receiving the truth, but uh, obviously we're not responding to it at all. We, we've made the decision to ignore it. Yeah, mm. yeah, okay. With the subsequent uh, painful long-term damage that yeah. that causes. And one of those damages, of course, is that we have, we find it a big struggle to receive new truth. Um, mm. And therefore 
we live life ba often based upon error most mm. of our life we mm. can live that way if we detune from our conscience mm -hmm. so it's actually a very damaging thing to do mm -hmm. but uh, remember the conscience itself is not good or bad the conscience just is it's an operating mechanism mm -hmm. that allows god to share truth yes. if you feel good or bad it's because of your feelings <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes those feelings are because we're completely ignoring the conscience and just feeling good and bad based on our own belief systems or we might feel good or bad in response to what we hear from the conscience yes yeah and either way it's still our own feelings yeah um the conscience itself is you know god's placed the mechanism there it's not from god's perspective it's not good or bad it just is a mechanism that allows god to share truth with you so from that perspective, it, it's God's demonstrate one of God's demonstrations of love to you yeah. that He wants to share truth with you. And that's yeah. all it is. It's not, it's not, uh, you know, something that's meant to make you feel good or make you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> when you feel good or feel bad from the operation of of a conscience, it's because of your own emotional condition and what's going on inside of you emotionally. And if you're ignoring it and feeling good, it's the same thing as mm -hmm. what's going on inside of you emotionally that causes you to ignore it and feel good. Yeah. And there's plenty of people who feel good about doing bad things. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, obviously they still have a conscience that's operating and, and it's not a bad conscience no. or a good conscience. Yeah. It's just an operating conscience that we're ignoring. Yeah, <laughs> got to. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's expand on that a little further talk about what having a clear conscience or a clean conscience means. Mm. Well, again, if we, you know, use some technically strict definitions here, obviously a clear conscience is a conscience that is clear, it works. <laughs> <laughs> and, and whatever God communicates to us is what we actually receive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so to me, that would be a, a technical definition, if you like, or, or a truthful definition of what it means to have a clear conscience. That, of course, is not what the Bible verses are referring to. No. That, you know, in First Timothy, um, that's not what they're referring to. But to me, that is what a clear conscience would mean. Mm -hmm. And using the strict definition of God's truth again, when it comes to having a clean conscience, mm -hmm. well, no person's conscience is unclean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so strictly speaking, there's no such thing as a clean conscience or a unclean conscience. There is just a conscience and it, and it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and God communicates truth to it. And whether it's clear or not will depend upon certain factors that we all of which we have control over mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i don't feel there's any such thing as an unclean conscience or a clean conscience yeah. um, obviously there is a clear conscience from a technical you know strictly technical definition yeah but of course none of these things that i'm saying are what those bible verses actually mean <laughs> so <laughs> perhaps we need to discuss what they mean yeah yeah well <laughs> let's talk about what what people mean generally when they refer to it a clean or a clear conscience because as you said it's not in they don't mean it technically because <laughs> no. many of us don't have a good understanding of the technicalities of the conscience anyway no. um mostly then we're talking about um feeling okay about what we're doing yeah in other words we feel free of guilt yes so basically what we're saying is that our thoughts words and actions are free of guilt so in other words, I did what I good, could to help. My conscience is clear or, you know, I, I told the truth. So my conscience is clear. We, we did yeah. what we believe is the best thing we could have done. And so now our conscience is clean or clear. Yeah. Uh, usually that's the way that people use this ter type of terminology. Yeah. Mm. But unfortunately, as you mentioned in our previous answer, just because someone doesn't feel guilt or they feel clear or clean in their conscience, doesn't actually mean they've acted in harmony with God's truth, does it? No, it only means that they've acted in harmony with what they believe to mm -hmm. be truth. That's all. <laughs> and 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 they're detuned from God's truth. Yes, yeah, yeah. so they could be partly tuned in or fully tuned in or not tuned in at all to God's truth. It just depends on you know whatever the whatever the subject matter is. But when people use the idea of a clean or a clear conscience, basically, really, what they're saying is. As regards their personal belief systems, mm -hmm. they don't feel guilty. Yeah. <laughs> now, from God's perspective, that doesn't mean much, no. actually. 
<laughs> because uh, God is completely aware that most of our belief systems here on earth at the moment are flawed and many of them are f so flawed that they are basically just evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately, many of us still call that, you know, do taking action that is even evil as having a clear, people have a mm. so-called clear conscience mm -hmm. about it. So, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a great disharmony between God's truth on the matter and the human general philosophy of truth on the matter. Yeah. That can be illustrated with the idea of going to war. Mm. You know, a lot of people who go to war feel they have a clear or a clean conscience in doing so. But, but God, if you listen to what God's saying via the conscience about going to war, it's a definite no, it's not good for you yeah. and it's not good for anybody else. And it's not a part of God's purpose. And also it's going to cause a lot of damage and, mm -hmm. and, and harm and also harm to yourself in your future as well. Yeah. So it's quite clear when you've got a clear, clear conscience with God, uh, in, with God as per the proper definition, it's quite clear also that the idea or aspect of going to war is, is completely flawed from mm. God's perspective. Mm. But many people still go to war and they still have a clear conscience doing so. Yeah. Which is an indication, uh, it's an illustration of, the, of how much of a discrepancy there is between God's viewpoint of truth, mm -hmm. absolute truth, and the human concepts of what they should get away with. <laughs> yeah. Well, and very often it's um, the concept of love, the definition of love that was taught to us in childhood, isn't it? That, that often is quite opposed to God's truth yeah. on matters. Yeah. In and our childhood, frequently we're taught eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which obviously extends to a life for a life. Mm. Mm. which means that under certain circumstances going to war is fine, yeah. is what, you know, you would think. But uh, that's not God's definition of love. Mm. So, so if we had a clear conscience, we would know that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to um, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. First Timothy. First Timothy, sorry, yeah. <laughs> 1 verse 5, yeah. 1. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, chapter, yes. Yep. Yep. It says, the goal of this commandment is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So how is love that comes from a pure heart, a clear, con a clear conscience and a sincere faith related to each other? How do those three things all come together? Well, again, we need to be a bit more specific, perhaps, in the Bible verses being like love can come from a multitude of sources. It depends what kind of love we're talking about here. Now, um, from, from God's perspective, um, love that God shares always comes from a clean heart because it's God's heart that it comes from. So, so if we're talking about God's love, mm -hmm. then, then obviously that's not really what's being referred to in the verse because if we're talking about God's love, well, God's love comes from God and therefore comes from a pure heart, yeah. a clean heart. And, uh, and God doesn't need faith. God knows the absolute truth about everything. Yeah. So, so faith from God's perspective is not related. And also God doesn't have a clear conscience. He, he doesn't have a conscience at all. Yeah. <laughs> he, he built one in the human. So, yeah. so if we're talking about God's love here, then obviously the verse doesn't apply. Well, let me let me uh, ask about the verse because really it's saying that the goal of this command is love. So I understood that to mean that someone is commanding a group to well, no, love. His, Paul in context would be referring to the command to love one another. Mm -hmm. So, so now we're talking about the love that comes from the individual, right. which is not the love that comes from God, yeah. but rather the come the love that comes from your heart or my heart. Now that, of course, is very much revolves around having a pure heart, a, a heart, a, and a pure heart could be defined as a person who mirrors exactly what is inside of themselves. So in other words, there's no facade in them. There's no falseness in them. There's, there's no portrayal of something that's false in them. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to manufacture a state. They are in the state. And that's what it means to have a pure heart. Mm -hmm. So, so, for, for a start, 
any real love has to come from a pure heart. Mm. <laughs> so that, that's really a given, um, given the fact that if we're falsifying what we're saying to people or we're being a false person, we're not reflecting what's actually in our heart, then naturally our heart no longer is pure and it's impossible for it to love while it's not pure. That's right. So, so, so sure, love definitely comes from a pure heart. That is a statement of truth if we're talking about the love that we have for others. Yes. It says a clear conscience. Well, love, a clear conscience, if we look at the pure definition of a clear conscience, we're talking about a clear connection between God's truth and, and what we're receiving. It says, yes, it's a good conscience, it says so. Yeah, so, yeah. but if we're talking about a clear conscience, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. we're talking about the connection. If we're talking about a good conscience, well, as we've discussed, there's no such thing as a good or a bad conscience. So <laughs> what do you think? So so if we, uh, I'm not sure where to take this discussion, but um, now I'm thinking about Paul and Timothy who, you know, recorded the the... Well, Paul the, wrote this letter to Timothy. To Timothy, yes. Yep. So... Um, they're trying to help people understand what it means to love, are they not? Well, they are, but uh, again, I think the words have been tainted quite significantly over time, as most of the Bible words have been. So, so then just to, for the purposes of this discussion, yeah. to say... It, is there a relationship between... <laughs> you get so specific on me. I, I'm, I haven't finished my discussion, but you're, you're trying to hammer me down still. <laughs> I apologise. So go right ahead. Let, right. Me not, uh, um, let me not interfere. So are we talking about what they really mean? <laughs> no, I'm... Or are we talking about the factual evidence about what the Bible verse actually says or what are we talking about here? I guess, I guess what I... I, I know what Paul really meant because I've talked to him about it and it, partly it was inspired from what I was telling him to say. But <laughs> So, of course, I know what he meant to say or what he meant to write. But, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, obviously things get a little distorted. But the reality is oh, yeah. that love that comes from within us for another person come, has to come from a pure heart. Yes. Secondly, it, it has to be in harmony with God's truth. So that's what it means to be in harmony with a clean or a good conscience. Yeah. So it has to be in harmony with God's truth. Yeah. It's, it can't be our own concept of what is love. It yeah. has to be God's concept of what is love yeah. in order for it to be pure love. Yeah. And it has to come from a sincere faith. A sincere faith meaning that we can't manufacture a faith based on a personal opinion. A sincere faith is based on absolute truth. It has to be based on absolute truth for it to be sincere. And we have to practice it. We have mm -hmm. to live it in our day-to-day -day life. That's what we need to do. Yeah. So, so a sincere faith is based on absolute truth, based on the connection that we receive through a clear conscience. And if we have those particular things, then it's high, more highly likely that uh, you know, we can demonstrate love, but only as long as we have a pure heart, a sincere heart as well, a heart that has a desire to be what it is rather than manufacture something that's a facade or a false or, or false. Yeah. So I feel that's what Paul was trying to say to Timothy. <laughs> yeah, look, I wasn't really <laughs> and interested mind you, in those guys. My opinion is Timothy knew more about it than Paul did <laughs> anyway, because uh, we knew Timothy yes. um, in our first century life. And obviously Paul was someone who came along after I, I died and after you had moved away to France. So, you know, what he was saying was inspired yeah. rather than something that came from within him at the time. Yeah. And uh, and Timothy did know, in fact, more about it mm -hmm. <laughs> than Paul did because Timothy had a bit more of a connection with his soul than Paul did at the time. Yeah. But uh, you can see that the words are actually have some validity, certainly, yes. and they mean something. They just perhaps don't mean exactly what people think they mean um based upon you know their suppositions and assumptions and and their false belief systems mm. so so what we're talking about is love that comes from god now love that comes from god is already coming from a pure heart it's god's heart and it's not based on a good conscience or a, or a sincere faith because it is something that is in, in god and therefore god does not need faith he he knows everything and God doesn't need a conscience either because mm. he created all things. He, mm -hmm. he knows what's right and what's wrong. Yeah.
So, so when we're talking about this love here, we're talking about the love that comes from a person to a person. Yes. And that certainly does need these particular qualities. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So um, it sounds like the qualities support each other. The, uh, that the clear conscience or the, the connection with conscience and the sincere faith purify the heart. Is that well, correct? I don't, I don't know if you could say it purifies the heart. Um, the purification of the heart is achieved through the reception of God's love, really. In other words, you know, the heart of a flesh uh, can only come about from the heart of a stone being transformed. Mm -hmm. And the heart of stone is what all humanity has from God's perspective, because they've yet to receive a part of God's nature. Mm -hmm. And it's only when we receive a part of God's nature that we really get a completely pure heart mm -hmm. so so in order so in order to ha have a pure love connection with another person in the end we are going to need to receive some of god's love mm -hmm. and and that's not what's being implied through the verse what's being implied through the verse is that no there are there is the love you have for another and that if we if we discuss that as a separate issue to the love that God can give to you yes. and transform you with, mm -hmm. then uh, yes, it does need these particular qualities. Mm. And each of those qualities are to a degree dependent upon each other. You know, mm -hmm. So if you have a clear conscience, a conscience that listens to God's truth and acts upon it, then obviously you've got to have quite a lot of sincerity. Mm -hmm. so, so therefore you will probably also have a sincere faith and if you act upon it and you're being driven by the motivations we've already talked about that should motivate the conscience, then it's likely that you'll also have a heart that is approaching purity. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you have a pure heart yet. A pure heart can only technically come about by being at one with God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is only achieved by the reception of God's love into the heart rather than the development of your love for another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at this particular text from, God, from God's love perspective, basically what we're saying is that once we hear God's truth, which comes via the clear conscience, yes. um, we can pray for God's love. As we pray for God's love, God's love, if we allow ourselves to receive it and we have sincere faith that it will be received, mm -hmm. it will purify our heart. Once we, our heart is purified, then every action we take will be sincere mm -hmm. and every action we take will be loving. Now, we could say under those circumstances, we have a clear connection with our conscience. We also, are, we also now, because we've been transformed in our heart, have a, have a clear, uh, a pure heart yeah. from God's perspective. And of course, the truth is, and our faith is not based upon personal opinion anymore. It's a sincere faith because it's based on absolute fact. <laughs> <Good to. laughs> so, so you could apply this verse in many different ways. Of course, the way Paul originally intended to apply it was all really about the love we have for one another. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there were some truths involved in what he said and obviously some things that needed a bit more clarification. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Thank you. <laughs> Conscience, faith, forgiveness and repentance. Now we're bringing four concepts really together. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and we've already established in our discussion today that the conscience can assist us to grow our faith. Mm -hmm. And growing faith makes us more likely in turn to listen and act upon the conscience. So yes. there is a very supportive cycle that starts to happen between faith and conscience. Yes. Okay. How then do those two factors, conscience and faith, work together to assist us to forgive and repent. All right, well, let's look at the operation of conscience first and then look at the operation of faith and then merge the two together. So, okay. so the operation of conscience is such that I am receiving God's truth about any specific matter mm -hmm. or, or said differently, I'm f receiving what is right and what is wrong about any specific matter or said differently, yeah. I am knowing what is sinful and what is not about uh -huh. any particular matter. Yes. So now I know sin and, and sin is the act of disobedience to love or disharmony with love. Every time I'm out of harmony with love, I have sinned. Mm -hmm. And 
the conscience mechanism can inform me when I'm about to sin or when I'm about to make a decision that would cause me to act in disharmony with love. Mm -hmm. It can also inform me when I'm about to act in a manner that's in harmony with love yes. and therefore in agreement with love and mm -hmm. therefore no, not a sin. Mm -hmm. It can tell me that too. Mm -hmm. so, so the conscience is helping me determine what the truth is. Yes. That's, that's the first thing. Now, faith assists me to make a had to have a desire to act in harmony with the truth I know. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, I've got the truth being told to me, which is via the conscience. Yeah. And then and so now I know what is right and what is wrong, or, or in other words, what I've done wrong or what I've done right. Yes. And what others have done wrong and what others have done right. Yes is known now because I have my connection with my conscience. Yes. Faith is what gets me to act upon my conscience. Mm -hmm. Desire, it, it, it generates with me, in me a desire to live in harmony with yes. the truth that I know or have received. Now that I am living in harmony with that truth, I would know what I have to be forgiven for because I did it wrong mm -hmm. and what I have to repent for mm -hmm. because I did it wrong, right? If someone else did it wrong. And I also know uh, what I've said is all right. Oh, sorry, sorry, and then, sorry. And then well, I would also know what I need to forgive others for because they did it wrong. Yes, I see. And what they need to repent for because what they do, of what they do wrong. Yes. I would know those things. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because the truth, God's truth via the conscious mechanism, is telling me that, mm -hmm. and I have faith in that. I'm, I'm, I, I believe that my, oh, these things that I've received are true, and I've acted upon them. I desire to act upon them sincerely, mm -hmm. which is my faith, my desire to act upon this truth I've received. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm in a state where I can determine for myself what I have done wrong, and what I've done right, yeah. and what others have done wrong, and what others have done right from God's perspective. Yeah. Now, obviously, that's going to be a great help for me in the processes of forgiveness and repentance. Absolutely. I won't be guessing mm -hmm. what I did wrong or guessing what I did right. <laughs> <laughs> I will know. Yeah. And I won't be guessing what others did wrong or right. And I, will, I will know. It won't be based on my childhood belief systems or anything. No, it's... Or my addictions, yeah. or my demands, or my unloving, my, my concept of what love should have been. It won't be based on any of those things. Mm -hmm. It'll be based on God's concept of what is right and what is wrong, mm -hmm. which is the only concept by which the laws of forgiveness and repentance operate. Yeah. So the beauty of that is because I'm now receiving God's truth, from God via the conscience mechanism, I now know what I need to forgive mm -hmm. and what I need to repent for. Mm -hmm. And I also know what others need to repent for and what I need to forgive in them. Yeah. I, I know these things because the truth has been shared with me. And the faith that I have will cause me to act upon the truth. Of course. Yes. The faith will drive me to that action. Mm -hmm. And the faith also assists me to understand that if I engage the laws of forgiveness and repentance, because I know what to forgive and repent, yeah. I, I engage the laws, my soul development and my personal condition will improve and I should have a happier life and I'll get closer to God. So this faith also lets me see all that yeah. as well. Yeah, mm. yeah, fantastic. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Let's now talk specifically about how the conscience plays a role in forgiveness. Mm. So how does the conscience uh, factor into our process of forgiveness? Well, obviously, as we've seen through the discussion about the conscience, this mechanism that God's provided lets God share absolute truth with us. So now that we know God's truth, you could say we know God's moral position. Yep about any matters mm -hmm. and in this case when we're looking at forgiveness of others mm -hmm. we now know the moral truth about what others did yeah not not our personal opinion and not what we think they did and not what we guess they do and not what yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. any of those kind of things not what you know what we resent about them or we just don't like the look at them so we don't want to forgive them none of yeah, that yeah 
it, it's we actually see God's moral position on the subject. Mm -hmm. So now that we know God's moral position on the subject, we know what is loving behavior and what is unloving behavior. And we know whether a person who we've interacted with in the past has engaged that behavior or not. Mm -hmm. We know. Mm -hmm. Therefore, now that we know God's moral position, we know what we need to forgive or repent for. Yes. for. Forg and in this case, we know what to forgive. Yes. If we know God's moral position of, of that something was wrong and the other person did it to us, then we know that we're going to have to forgive them for it. That's right. <laughs> right? And we also know that we will need to be forgiven by others at some point when we can see we did things as in disharmony with God's moral position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know that that now has placed the burden onto somebody else that they will need to forgive us yeah. at some point if, yeah. if they want to have a happy life. Yeah. Mm. The conscience also tells us about the consequences, doesn't it? So not just the wrong, mm -hmm. but the consequences of the wrong done by others to yes. us and to them. Yes, it fully informs us of all the details yeah. of how it's wrong, mm -hmm. of what it did, how it felt. It, it informs us about everything. So a person who's truly connected with their conscience not only knows what the wrong was, but they also know how it was wrong, why it was wrong where it was wrong, with whom it was wrong, mm -hmm. and those kind of things too. They know all the details about it. Mm -hmm. So that's an indication of somebody who has a very open and clear conscience, mm -hmm. somebody who's able to listen to God about all the details about what has been done mm -hmm. and able to see the, with clarity all the different consequences of what was done right the way through to the long term. Remember we said right at the beginning of this discussion about forgiveness and repentance, that there are long-term consequences and short-term consequences. Yes. There are immediate yeah. consequences. Well, a person who's in this state knows them all. Yeah. They understand each one. Yeah. They understand the effects that it has and the difficulties of reversing the effects that it has. Yeah. And that's the beauty of, of having this direct connection through the conscience with God. Mm -hmm. you, you can know all this detail that would otherwise be very hard to gather except by painful personal experience. Yes. In other words, very hard to gather unless you it, the same thing had happened to you, right? And therefore you could have some sympathy for it, for what it, what it is. Mm -hmm. Where this way, you don't need to have the same thing happen to you for you to know what somebody did. Yeah. And that's the good thing about it. Yeah. You could see clearly yeah. what somebody is doing and what they're not doing that's in harmony with love or out of harmony with love. Got to. Mm. So then once we know God's truth about um, what has been done to us and God's moral position about it, we can then start to begin grieving really the, the actual damage that's been done to us. Yes, in the first three or four sessions we talked about how the, pro the emotional process of forgiveness, didn't we, and what yeah. was involved. And yes, once you understand what, how you have been harmed, that, that was one of the questions we raised back then. We said, how do we know we've been harmed? Sometimes we think we've been harmed when we haven't. And sometimes yeah. we haven't. We think we haven't been harmed when we yeah. have. Yeah. And, and the way we know is by God informing us. It's, that's the easiest way yes. <laughs> to know. Once we've got a connection with the conscience, we will know how we've been harmed, how we've harmed others, and how we haven't been harmed when we thought we had, and things like that. All of that will be known. Yeah. But once we know it, now we can go through the emotional process required of forgiveness, which is an emotional process of releasing inside of us the feelings and emotions that we have as a response to what others did to us mm -hmm. that was out of harmony with love. But it can only be what others did out of harmony with love. Yeah. If they did things in harmony with love and we felt offended by that, then from God's perspective, there's nothing to forgive. That's right. Yeah, and if we're trying to forgive somebody for that, we're way up the wrong path. <laughs> Which is why the conscience helps, doesn't it? Exactly. And once we finish that grieving process about what was actually done, then then we can forgive. Yes. We can say we, we are forgiving then. Yes, and we'll no longer make a mountain out of something that hasn't been done. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I see a lot of people doing this. They say, oh, yes, I forgive you for that, you know when actually the person who they're forgiving actually, from God's perspective, did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And and obviously this is all just a fake forgiveness now. Yeah. It's, it's all a demand. Of, 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 it's actually a, something that the person who's doing the fake forgiving has to repent for. Yes. Actually. So, yes. you know, 
the beauty of having the connection with the conscience, if we don't get tied up in all those knots of, of who defines what is right and wrong, because when we have a clear conscience, God defines what's right and wrong. Yeah. Therefore, we know exactly what to forgive and what to repent for. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right. Let's now talk about how the conscience plays a role in repentance. How does the conscience help us in this process of, forgi- of repentance, Rana? Well, it's very similar to the process of forgiveness. Remember we said in the process of forgiveness that the way the conscience plays a role in it is that God informs us about what other people have done and whether that thing was morally right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, with regard to repentance, God informs us about what we have done and whether it was morally right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is good, right? Because we, we, we are now not having to, you know, go by where, what Joe Blow over there said about me or what, what my son or daughter or father or mother or sister or brother or my friends down the road think I should be, you know, repent for. Yeah. But rather we're going by what God knows and God, God is saying, no, that was morally wrong. Yeah. So, so now I am informed about what is morally wrong and as, uh, as the same as with re- forgiveness, we're not only informed about what was morally wrong, but we're also informed about all the consequences of our choices and decisions and what happened and how that harmed people and the damage that was done to people and how difficult their lives were made through our choices and decisions. We're informed about all of that as well. Yeah. So now that we're informed about all those things, mm-hmm. We can go choose to go, if we're sincere, we would go yep. or choose to go through the process of repenting for what we've done, mm-hmm. feeling sorry for what we've done and then correcting the wrong. And then also getting underneath that and actually having to, as we explained in our first few sessions, every repentance process also involves a forgiveness process That's of right. how we came about to have that injury, which then drove us to do that wrong thing. Yeah. And we will clear that away as well. Mm. Mm. And in our notes, we've described that. We've said that stage one of repentance is about it's being correctly informed mm-hmm. about God's truth and God's moral position. Yep. Uh, the details of how we've sinned yes. against God, ourselves and others. Yes. Once we are informed, this allows us to begin the process of grieving and releasing the emotions we have inside of us as a result of that painful corrective compensation. Yes. Which we've described compensation. So, in so previous all sessions. of what you're describing is still stage one. That's right. <laughs> that we incurred when we enga- engaged in the behaviour we need to repent for. So that's, that's right. stage one that's, of repentance. That's stage one of repentance. And God's truth is a, obviously via the conscience is a great help with that. Because it's telling us exactly what we did wrong, exactly why it was wrong, exactly how it's harmed other people, if we want to hear it. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Um, And then stage two is after we've released that compensatory pain, we then begin to feel the reason why we engaged in the behaviour in the first place. We do have to let go of the compensatory pain before we'll feel that properly. Yes. Yep. So then we... uh, Once that happens and we feel our motivation, then we're correctly informed about God's truth and God's moral position about how others have treated us when we were a child. That's right. And we can begin this process of grieving and releasing the emotions associated with that treatment, uh, which is actually our forgiveness process, which you spoke about. And that's really the completion of the repentance process, because once those emotions are gone, we'll never engage in that same behaviour again. Yes. So as we said in the first three sessions, that the the repentance process not only involves the forgiveness process, but some additional steps. And what we've just described is the additional steps. Mm -hmm. Stage one are the additional steps. Mm -hmm. And then stage two is the repentance process, the forgiveness process that we still need to engage. The reason why that happens is because there is something that's gone on in our past which has determined within us that we will go ahead and do something that's morally wrong. Mm -hmm. And we've got to find out what the cause of our decision is, the cause of our moral wrongness, if you like. So stage one is all about dealing with the effect of it. And stage two is all about dealing with the cause of it. Yeah. But both are required because when we do things towards others that harm them, 
there are obviously effects that we need to feel sorry for, mm -hmm. as well as trying to find out the reason inside of ourselves as to why we went ahead and did such a thing. Yeah. 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 And very often people try to do one or the other and it doesn't work. If we're sincere, we naturally do both. So it's a sign of some level of insincerity when people try to immediately just go to the harm that was done to them or just um, self-flagellate about what they did without trying to discover the real motivations behind their behaviour. That's right. And, it, and it's actually can, the stage one, if you're not careful, can, if it's done improperly, will end up with a person being very self-absorbed and, and often self-attacking and, yeah. uh, you know, living a life of guilt for the rest of their life and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously not God's intention with mm -hmm. the process of forgiveness and repentance. Mm -hmm. The process of repentance requires we go through stage one to understand what we did and mm -hmm. the damage it did to others. Mm. Once we are sincere about correcting the cause of that, we'll go through stage two. Yeah. And frequently, most people don't do that. You know, yeah. so it's very rare for people to try to find the cause of the reason why they did such a thing. Yeah. But unless you find the cause, true repentance has not been completed. Mm -hmm. Obviously, though, the conscience is helping me in every step of the way. It even helps me. You can even ask God and say, have I finished repentance yet? No. <laughs> And you can yeah. get direct answers and go, yeah. okay, why is that? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. and you can get direct answers about that. The conscience can help us in every step of the way, yeah. but it depends on how clear it is yeah. and how much we want to hear it as to how well we will respond to what is being said to us via the conscience from God. And a lot of the other factors that we've talked about in this discussion today about uh, the sensitivity to conscience and faith the role of faith like all of those things come into play in to assist us to be have this really clear communication and it's sort of like a magical you know google on steroids machine isn't it <laughs> from the most loving creator that there is um to ask questions and receive answers yeah um, i don't know if i'd compare it with google on steroids <laughs> Google doesn't always tell you the truth, whereas God always does. So I was uh, trying to think of some way where you can ask questions and receive rapid answers. I, suppose I agree you could call that it, Google is not necessarily telling us call the it truth. A, yeah, you yeah. could call it a truth search engine, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah. Obviously, I see it a bit more personally it's than far that more because, personal, it, because yeah. it's a, a, a connection with God that you can maintain that gives you information. And, and it's, a, it's not communication with a thing. It's mm -hmm. not communication with a power source. It's communication with the creator of the universe yeah. telling you. Yeah. And, and that, that obviously is going to be very, very powerful. Yeah. So the conscience itself is such a powerful mechanism for, for good in our life. Mm. And maybe before we finish a conclusion, we need to add this particular thing to our, mm -hmm. to our discussion. And that is the conscience itself is one of the most powerful tools that are going to help us to enter the states of forgiveness and repentance. The conscience can help us develop within ourselves the desire to go through forgiveness and repentance. Yes. Now, there are most of the other things or mechanisms that God has provided to assist us with forgiveness and repentance are law-based mechanisms that force it yes. at some point. But the conscience is a mechanism that God provided that is a very gentle mechanism helping us come to our own conclusions that we need to go through the process. Yes. So this is what I love about the conscience. The conscience itself is, is a powerful mechanism that God inbuilt in us that allows us to see and then act upon what we see as truth because we know it to be truth from God's perspective. Mm. And it lets us uh, develop uh, you know, through it. We can develop a sincerity of heart yeah. that is not possible by just being pummeled by the law into yes. submission. Yes. Right? So the law of compensation, as we've already described in the past sections on compensation, what it does is it acts upon our actions, attempting to either correct them or reinforce them through positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Conscience is not like that. It's just informing you of your choices mm -hmm. and it gives you the ability to make a heartfelt decision or not. Yeah. 
if you make a heartfelt decision, the rewards of doing so are great. Mm. But if you decide to not make one and that, then all it means is the laws will kick into effect. Yeah. The laws of compensa compensation will kick into effect. And at some point you'll be forced to see what you just did wrong and, and the effects that it had upon others and so forth or upon yourself. The beauty of the conscience is, it, is that there's no force in it. It, it enables a voluntary act, whereas the laws finish up enforcing yeah. their action, the actions upon you. So we talked about compensation almost pummel, pummeling us into submission. <laughs> the corrective compensation can feel feel like that sometimes. Like that sometimes. Yeah, um, and it needs to be like that to be loving. Yes, because otherwise we'd, we we endlessly do wrong things and wonder why we're in so much pain and suffering, but have no real cognizance of the reasons. Yeah. 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 So, so um, do you see it sort of as a, a stepping stones of sincerity? I mean, when my heart is very closed and I'm very cynical and I've got many, many false beliefs and, I, you know, I'm hard, my, my, heart, my heart is of hard. stone. Yeah. Yes. Um, Compensation is like this loving provision that can help start to soften my heart. And then... But it um, softens the heart through your experience. Yes. Like you experience things you did not expect. You experience things that are pain and suffering and that's how it softens you. Yeah. yeah. It has to happen because uh, you, you're obviously so hard that you're not listening to anything else. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And then so, so once that softening occurs, then we might start to have a softer heart and seek answers. And if we develop some faith, then the conscience can become this very important guide. Well, this, or... is, well, this is the thing. The conscience is operating whether we have a, heart, ha a hard heart or not. Mm -hmm. so, so the reality is we could choose to go through this voluntary process of finding out mm -hmm. what the truth is from God's perspective. Because our conscience is always working. Yeah. It's, God's always trying to share the truth with us. So it's actually not dependent upon whether we have a heart or hard or a soft heart. Yeah, so that's I'm very interested in that. Yeah. So you're saying that someone who's very cynical and shut down and uh, can immediately make connection with their conscience. They can. But they must have some sincerity. We've already established in this discussion about conscience, there must be sincerity in them. Yes, I'm saying they can. But will they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would depend on a lot of things. And in particular, it depends on their sincerity. But what I like about it is that it does depend upon their sincerity. Yes. And yeah. that, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. is, shouldn't you have an easier process if you're sincere? Mm -hmm. So, of course, the, the way God's made it is very, very clever, if you think about I it. I do. Because what it's basically saying is if you're not sincere, the laws will eventually Generate, generate a, and encourage a yeah. state of sincerity. Yeah. And even if they don't, you're still going to have to pay the penalty for what you did. Yes. Right. You, and, and if that's a long winded thousand year process, then it's a long winded thousand year process mm -hmm. of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. That's how it will be. Mm -hmm. But every person also be given this other option. The other option is a direct contact with God and find out sincerely from God what has been done wrong or right. Mm. And, and not just by you, but by everybody. Yeah. And now I know what to forgive in others, and I also know what to repent for myself. Mm -hmm. And not only do I know, but now I have a choice. I can choose to voluntarily go through the process of forgiveness and repentance, through the emotional stages of both processes. I can do it voluntarily without having to be pushed into it by the law of compensation. Yeah. So I think it's a wonderful mm. provision of God and like, uh, like it, it's way up there with God's love in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. other things that God provides because it, it, it's a built in mechanism in the soul. Obviously, it's such a loving provision mm -hmm. as a built in mechanism. It, it's it's it to me, it's like the gift of free will, yeah. the conscience and the gift of free will really operate in harmony with each other yes. to a large degree and the conscience you can voluntarily, which is using your free will, your mm -hmm. desire to do something, you can voluntarily go ahead and do something and the rewards of voluntarily doing it mean you 
remove from yourself all of those difficult times associated with an act not being voluntary, where it's forced upon you. Yeah, you mean the workings of corrective compensation? The corrective compensation yes. being forced upon you. Yes, and you, you remove from you also those painful times that just happen, um, yeah, as a result of... Just not knowing. Not, yeah, ignorance. Uh, yeah. Ignorance, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the beauty of it as well. Yeah. By choosing to not be ignorant, yeah. you reap the benefits of no longer being ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so again, it's a driven by your desire, like a sincere desire to not be ignorant yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. And, and a sincere desire to not skip over things is a good yeah. thing. God rewards all that. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the conscience too, is it enables all of those beautiful aspects of ourselves which are voluntarily undertaken or desired to be undertaken mm -hmm. to be rewarded mm. in a different way than if we're forced to go about some kind of corrective measures yeah mm. it's it's sort of like um sometimes i think it's like harnessing your superpowers as a soul that god as god created you i mean so many of um humanity so mu so much of humanity even struggles to understand the gift of free will but when you understand that and say you, which is something that's already given. It's mm -hmm. already it's a gift inbuilt. already given. Inbuilt. It's already given a gift already given, and then use the conscience in harmony with your choices, uh, which are a reflection of your will and desire. Which is another mechanism already given. That's right. It's another gift. So it's it's like you have these superpowers that you don't even most of the world is unaware of, and when I say superpowers, uh, um, perhaps that's not the right thing, but. It's like a pathway to happiness that is, it's inbuilt into us, which we can add additional gifts to, such as receiving God's love, if we um, choose again mm. for that to happen. But the pathway to happiness is already kind of inbuilt into our natural functionings. But it's very sad that we're so almost opposed diametrically through our injured state to, the, to understanding those gifts. Yeah. But once we do, it's like incredible. Yeah. And here we see a recurring theme. That's the recurring theme of gifts being given to us based upon choice. Yeah. So we can see here that the conscience mechanism, what well, it's been a gift given to us, but we have to choose to use it. Just like we've been given the gift of free will, but we have to choose to use it wisely. Yeah. These gifts that God has given to us all revolve around choice, as does the choice to receive God's love. That's also a choice. Mm -hmm. So we can see this recurring theme of choice. God is enabling choice. When we decide to not make choices, not make decisions, not make wise choices for ourselves, then the law must force us into some kind of submission mm -hmm. to itself, mm -hmm. to the law's own rules. Mm -hmm. But when we engage choice, we are now above the law. Mm -hmm. We are now automatically engaging the law, but we're doing more than that because we're now choosing to exceed the law. Mm -hmm. And God rewards people who choose to exceed the law mm -hmm. through their own actions. So, so for ex an example of that is the law of the land says you shouldn't do something like you must, or you should do something like you must pay your taxes. Yeah, you could liken it to. Instead of the law having to force you to pay your tax and mm -hmm. you only pay exactly the amount, mm -hmm. from God's perspective, when you choose to pay your tax and you don't have to be forced and you decide to give more than what, what was demanded by the law, God rewards that. Now, yeah. the law probably wouldn't, human mm -hmm. law probably wouldn't, but God's law does. Yeah. And this encourages us to enter states not only voluntarily, but also with desire. Mm -hmm. And so God's basically encouraging us all to exercise desire. And if we relate that to our series that we've been discussing, yes. God's encouraging us through the operation of the conscience to exercise a desire for forgiveness yeah. and a desire for repentance, yeah. rather than just be forced into it by the law. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's beautiful. <laughs> Well, that concludes session 12 in our series on the laws pertaining to forgiveness and repentance. We'll do a very quick recap mm -hmm. um, and then talk about what we're going to talk about next session. Sure. Yeah. So the first uh, three sessions, we talked about truth, how, God, how we determine what God's truth is, 
God's truth about forgiveness and repentance, the emotional processes of forgiveness and repentance and our responsibility to forgive and repent. So that was the basic or the foundation part of our discussion. Yes. Yeah. Then in sessions four to eight, we talked about compensation and we talked about sowing and reaping in kind, sowing and reaping proportionately, sowing and reaping when we do nothing, what's going on there and how those laws are operating mm -hmm. to cause us to grow in a sincerity and a desire to forgive and repent. Yes. And now in this last session, uh, session which we've got one more session off because yes. we want to answer some questions about the conscience. Mm -hmm. But in this section about the conscience, which was from session nine onwards, we, we, we have been discussing the conscience itself, how it operates and all of the little intricacies about the conscience, including how the conscience actually impacts upon our desire to forgive and repent which we've gone through today. So, so by now, all of our listeners should be getting a real clear picture that we've got the forgiveness event and repentance processes. We've got the compensatory laws acting to get us to a state where we want to forgive or repent. We've got our conscience mechanism built into the soul, which is God's way of short circuiting the compensation yes. methods so that we can get into the processes of forgiveness and repentance without needing all this force upon us to mm -hmm. do so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now that we've got this picture about how the forgiveness and repentance process works and the different functionings of the soul mm -hmm. and the different laws that impact upon the process, and we'll deal with some questions that we deal with, to, you know, the next time we get together mm -hmm. about the conscience. Once we've got that complete picture, now we can go and answer these questions that our, our listeners have asked about forgiveness and repentance. And we should be able to answer those questions quite rapidly now, yeah. referring to the different aspects that we've already discussed so that people can completely understand the processes of forgiveness, repentance in their own lives. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Darlin. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you for session 13, where we'll be answering questions about the conscience and its operations. Yeah. Thanks for your time today. <laughs> Thanks, babe.